All right, if you would take your Bible, and if you'd like to follow along, go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. The book of Colossians, chapter 1, once we're all there, we'll read it together. All right, Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 8. Uh, People of God, would you listen now to the precious, holy, and inerrant words of God? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you, in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Amen. May God bless the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of his word. Well, this book of Colossians, I'm sure you are familiar with it. Um, It's an exciting book, in my opinion, because it has such a unique focus on the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. Um, I love it personally. It, it, It has done a great deal for my spiritual life to meditate on what they call this Christ hymn later on in chapter 1, and, and also to look at the combat that Paul does against what's called the Colossian heresy, this false teaching that he's dealing with uh, in chapter 2 especially, but really throughout the whole book. And so what I'd like to do is walk through these first eight verses with you, and I'm going to focus especially on this idea of the supremacy of and the sufficiency of Christ. Now, we will just say quickly a little bit of background about Colossians to to refresh us. Uh, What is this? It's a letter sent from the Apostle Paul to this Christian church at Colossae. Colossae was a city, not an important one, not an exceedingly large one uh, in the time of Paul. And if you were to pull up a map online of present-day Turkey, that would be the area in which you would see this small city of Colossae. It's not there anymore. It's just ruins at this point. But, and, and, and it wasn't a very important uh, city in Paul's time either, but it was important uh, in, in the centuries prior to Paul's time. There were many Jewish families in Colossae, and it had its, it had its significance in various ways that don't really relate to our study, but it's an interesting thing to look into. But the reason that Paul wrote this letter seems to be that the church was under attack from a very unusual false teaching, scholars have struggled to get a handle on what was even going on. The, it's sort of a smorgasbord of different religious ideas that are anti-Christian. It includes strange things such as rituals, religious rituals, uh, fasting, asceticism. These are some of the things these false teachers were recommending. They were recommending things such as Jewish observances, ecstatic visions where they would claim to see into the heavens and then they would receive a revelation and they would speak it to the church. They would even apparently recommend the occult worship of the angels. Very strange, very strange stuff that was happening here. And so Paul, Paul responded to this, these, this false teaching, basically with a powerful affirmation and assertion of the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. Now, I know you know what these words mean, but I'm just going to define them uh, anyway. What do we mean when we say that Christ is supreme? Well, we mean that he is over all. He is above all. He's more powerful than all. 
He is completely Lord of all. There are no exceptions. Uh, He is the master of all things. And because of that supremacy, for anybody to come with a false teaching that claims to add something to him, like it's great that you believe in Jesus, but it's not enough. You need something extra beyond Jesus. For them to do that is to assault the unique supremacy of Christ. And then we say that Christ is sufficient. By that, we simply mean that he is enough. If you have Christ, you don't need anything else religiously. You don't need any other religious ideas to add to Christ as if he were lacking. He's not. He is completely supreme and sufficient. But in order to pursue our study here, let's ask a question. We're going to pretend like we are in dialogue with these false teachers who were in Colossae. And we'll go ahead and humor them, okay? We'll ask the question. They say Christ is not enough. So let's ask the question, is Christ enough? Is he enough for the religious fulfillment that our souls need? Is he enough for the spiritual fulfillment that our souls need? You know, and let's even humor the the false teachers for a moment. Let's say that maybe he's not enough. Maybe our religion, we as Christians, and in particular Reformed Christians, maybe our religion is a little bit sparse, a little bit bare, right? Like I notice our room uh, doesn't seem to have a whole lot of ornate uh, pictures and images and colors and incense and bells and whistles. I mean, right? It's a pretty, it's a fairly plain room, isn't it? I see some interesting books in back. But maybe, maybe we're missing out. Maybe there does need to be more to add to Christ, to really spice things up the way the false teachers would say. So we'll humor them. We'll look now at the introduction of the letter, and we will gather from Paul several things he reveals to show, no, Christ is more than enough. What's funny about Paul, you know, Paul is a unique person. He writes an introduction to a letter, and he reveals more deep theology in it than some pastors ever preached their whole lives, seemingly, right? I mean, Paul reveals more theology in his introduction than some seminary professors given an entire lecture. And so seemingly, without even meaning to, in just the introduction of Paul's letter, he reveals numerous points that show that Christ is more than enough for our spiritual and religious fulfillment, okay? So I'm going to pick out four gifts from God, four gifts from the fullness of Christ that Paul reveals in this introduction. And as we meditate on these gifts together, we're going to keep this question before our minds, like we're having this discussion with the false teachers. Is Christ enough? Is he really all we need? So let's look at it. Four gifts we receive from Christ's fullness. Here's the first one. Here's number one. When you are in Christ and you experience his fullness, you receive, number one, a sure word from heaven. A certain communication from another world. Look at verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And just stop right there. What's an apostle? What does that word mean? You can answer if you know. Go ahead. What? Messenger? Yeah, that's right. That's right. A sent one, a delegate, envoy. We might think of an ambassador. Say the, the, the U.S. ambassador to China or something would be like an apostle in the sense of being somebody who represents another with their authority to act on their behalf to a certain extent. Well, that's what an apostle is at the basic level. Of course, we know that the authority of Paul and the other apostles is utterly unique. Do you believe that there are apostles today? Yes, no, maybe, different ideas? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If you mean, do you believe there are people we send to other places with the gospel to establish the church? Well, of course, there are those. We have missionaries, right? Yes, in that sense, if we mean ministry apostolic in the sense of sending people, yes, of course, we've, we've had missionaries since the beginning. But think about this. If we're talking about people who have the power to reveal the will, of, will and mind of God at the level 
of Paul and Peter and James and John and the rest of the, the 12, 12 apostles? No, absolutely not, right? Those guys were unique. Would, would you agree with that? Those guys, we've never had anybody like that. Do you think there's anybody today who could write scripture like Paul did? I bet we don't believe that. I'd assume that we don't, right? No, no, that's completely unique. And it has to be, because guess what? If there's somebody who can do that, then they have equal authority with Paul the Apostle and the Scripture itself. God forbid. That's not a true doctrine. That, that would be very, very dangerous for the Christian church. So what we have in Paul as an apostle is a messenger who brings us the words of God in a way that has never been done in history otherwise, apart from the other apostles, and apart from another group of people earlier than the New Testament. Can you think of another group of, of men who were similar to the apostles? The prophets, absolutely. You know, Isaiah and Moses and Jeremiah, these men functioned the way the apostles do, except that these men, Isaiah, Moses, etc., were in the Old Covenant. And this is why I would tell you that the apostles are, are really the New Covenant counterpart of the Old Testament prophets. And they're very unique. They're very, very unique because they have this ability to reveal the Word of God word for word. Apart from the prophets and apostles, we've never seen anything like this in the history of the church, and we never will. We never will because they're very unique. Now, why is this so important in terms of our enjoyment of the fullness of Christ? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that we as human beings living in this world, do we need religious certainty? Do we need a word we can count on and know that it's true? I mean, what if we didn't have the Bible? You know, there are a lot of people who would say, the Bible is interesting and it has value, but it's not like if we didn't have it, you know, like the world would like go insane or something. Are you sure? Because I live as a 21st century Westerner, and I'm in the midst of a culture right now that is asking questions about things that no one probably ever dreamed in the history of the world they'd ask questions about, right? Let's just take gender confusion as just one very obvious example. Do you think that as a society we could have reached the issues of gender confusion we now face if people had continued to believe the Bible was true? I don't think we could have got there. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. But the scripture as a word from God is absolutely needed. Otherwise, we are going to go to crazy places as a culture and as individuals. We need that. We need a certain word. Without it, we don't have ground under our feet. We're just floating. And really, we're falling. But if you are a Christian, you're not wondering about issues of, say, is there a God? Is Jesus who he said he is? What is sin? What is righteousness? How should I live? Where do we come from? Is it evolution? Is it creation? What is it? Where are we going? What is the future? Is there a judgment? Is it nothing? Do you just die and then the universe just suffers a heat death and, and, and is no more? Which, what is it? The scripture comes in and tells you, you can be certain of God's existence and Christ as Savior and creation and judgment in the future, the resurrection. You can be certain that God will forgive your sins. You don't have to sit and wonder. And people absolutely need that. It is part of the fulfillment we require as human beings in order to function rightly. And you have that in Christ. You receive that from his fullness. So that's our first point. In Christ's fullness, we have a sure word from heaven. So we ask the question, is Christ enough? Well, the answer is yes. And this is the first way that we see it. Second, second point, second gift from God that we receive in the fullness of Christ is this, a special status before God. Look at verse 2. This is who Paul writes to, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. Now, what is a saint? Can anybody tell me? 
It's a Christian. That's right. It's a Christian. And specifically, it's a Christian viewed according to a certain reality. Christians are people who, like everybody else, were born into sin and under the wrath of God and were part of the defiled, common realm of the world. But God grabbed us and brought us in Jesus to himself, and he made us special. He took us out of the realm of the common and profane, and he set us into the realm of the holy. What does it mean to be holy? Let me give you an example. Suppose that you lived 3,000 years ago when the temple, the Jewish temple, was still standing. And suppose that one day... You were walking along and you noticed that one of the priests had accidentally left one of the temple bowls outside, outside of the temple. He just wasn't thinking he had a lot going. And you know that they were commanded to make bowls as part of their their worship at the temple, right? And you see this bowl and you think, that's a good looking bowl. That would be a great addition to all my bowls at home. Would it be okay for you to grab that bowl and take it home? Why not? Yeah, it's special, right? It's holy. It belongs to God. It's not for you to eat your Cheerios from. It's for God's service specifically. So much so that as an exhibition of how serious this is, when Uzzah, during the transportation of the ark, sees the ark start to wobble on the cart and puts out his hand to stop it, he is struck dead. That is because while they were transporting the ark, they were failing to appreciate the holiness of God and that they needed to do it the way that he said in order to maintain reverence for that holiness. That's how serious it is. And now Christians, you're the bull. We are these holy objects that have been made clean and special for the service of God. You are in a completely new position and you're not here because you took a pilgrimage to Mecca, or did enough good works, or gave to the poor, or served at church, or preached a sermon, or or whatever, you are in this holy position sheerly from the grace of God. Because God is love, and he has chosen to gather us to himself to be loved, to be forgiven, to be possessed by him as his own people. So is Christ enough? This this we get from the fullness of being in Jesus. It's one more reason why we could never possibly need anything else. We don't need this religion plus a little bit of another one. No, Christ will certainly do. That's the second reason that we have a special status before God. Here's the third. In Christ, from his fullness, we receive a future hope. Look at verse 3. I'm going to start at three, but really what we're looking for is in five. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. What is this hope? What is he talking about? When he says hope here, This is what we would call an objective hope, meaning it isn't describing my experience of hoping for something. It's describing the something itself. So if I have a, a grandfather who loves me dearly and is a millionaire and has decided to make me the sole heir of his great fortune, and I'm hoping for the day when it all falls into my hands and I get to possess it, What I'm looking forward to is the estates and the money and the property and and whatever else that he has. The, the, The hope is the thing itself that we're looking for, right? What do we have as Christians? What does the scripture say is coming to us in the future? Well, we have already been saved in a sense. The scripture also teaches that we are currently being saved right now as we're here, and the scripture also says that in the future, we will be saved. So different aspects of salvation. In the future, 
we are going to experience the complete removal of sin from our lives. You will not be a sinner in any sense in the future. On the last day, God is going to completely take away all of your evil desire that we still struggle with, all of your pride, all of your greed, all of your anxiety, sinful anxiety. Some anxiety is not sin, by the way. Some is, is something different. But much of our anxiety is sinful. God's going to take that away. All of our sinful depression, those kinds of our depression that are sinful, God's going to remove all of it. God is going to remove all evil from our world so that we will no longer live in a place where you fear to even read the news when you get up in the morning. God is going to be here himself. Revelation describes God making the whole world into a garden, like the original paradise. God is going to be here. You know, in Revelation at the end, there's no temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, they are the temple. He'll be here. That is the hope and more that I didn't even mention to which we go. So, is Christ enough? Now, let me show you something. Let me show you something that is a helpful tip for your Christian life. In verse 5, 4 and 5, you see the familiar Christian triad of faith, hope, and love. You recognize those. You remember 1 Corinthians 13 that talks about faith, hope, and love? Faith means you trust God's promises. Love means that you self-sacrificially do good to others for the sake of God's glory and for their good. And hope means you eagerly desire the fulfillment of God's promises. The construction in verses 4 and 5 is interesting. It actually seems to make hope the driver of both faith and love. In other words, this could mean that if you were to say to me, you know, Dave, I've got to admit, I have kind of a problem with faith. I often don't trust God and his promises in the Bible the way I should. Okay, fair enough. That's something we struggle with. Let me give you one tip. This could be what's going wrong. Your hope may be too weak. You may not be desiring these great promises strongly enough. You may not be eager enough for what God has said he would do for you. And it could be as, that as you increase that hope, your faith is going to grow. You may say to me, well, you know, I really have a problem with loving other people. I'm frankly very selfish. And it does not come natural to go out of my way to do good to other people the way the scripture requires. Okay? According to the construction of the text, if you, your hope will increase for the glorious promise that's ahead for you, your love for others also will increase. That's a good tip for the Christian life. All these things affect each other. And if you have this incredible hope and you, your heart is lifted up by it, it's going to get easier to love other people biblically. It's going to get easier to have a strong and abiding and steady faith in God and in his word. And that's what we have. We have from the fullness of Christ a hope. So we ask our question again, is Christ enough? Is he all we need? Maybe we need to throw in a little bit of new age too. Maybe we should throw in some Islam. A little sprinkle of Islam couldn't hurt, right? Uh, maybe some Buddhism. This is what they were facing. And Paul's answer is no, no. Jesus is more, much more than enough. Number four, last one, last point here. Last gift we receive in this text from the fullness of, of Christ, being in Christ, is this. We receive a mission. Look at verse, excuse me, I'm going to cough. Verse, it's six, but we'll start, get a running start at verse five. Look at this. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, 
uh, even as, uh, uh, just as in all the world, also it is constantly, look at this, bearing fruit and increasing. Okay, and then stop there. He's describing this. He's saying, hey, Colossians, I'm so glad that you heard the gospel and it's growing and increasing in you. And by the way, it's doing that in the whole world everywhere too. Isn't this great? The gospel's just advancing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But the words that he uses there in Greek, the bearing fruit and increasing, does that remind you of any other place in the Bible? Bearing fruit and increasing. Anything. Tell me a Bible book. Does that sound like something you've heard before? How about be fruitful and multiply? Where's that from? Genesis. What's happening in Genesis when God gives that command, be fruitful and multiply? Creation, right? It's his original mandate to both his human creatures and his animal creatures to, to, ba- to reproduce, to fill the earth with life. You know, God basically comes in and he makes the world and then he orders it, right? He, he separates dry land and, and water and sky and, and land and he sets everything up in an orderly way so that he can then fill it with this life. That's what he wants to get to. God wanted to have a world that was absolutely bursting with this life that he had made. And specifically, specifically, he wanted it to be full of human life because only humans are the image of God. And so what God wants is a a world, a palace as it were, his palace where he is king and every room is lined with these beautiful mirrors. That's what the image of God is. We're in his image to, to show him. And so these mirrors would catch this divine light that God is putting out, and they'd be full of this light, and then they would shine it out. And then the mirrors would catch light coming from God, which is in the mirror, and then goes to the next mirror and the next mirror. It would be a brilliance of glory in this world. That's what God wanted. Now, I guess, ah, shucks, the fall happens, and, and I guess it's on to plan B, right? <laughs> uh, brothers and sisters, there is no plan B. There isn't. We're still on plan A. Because when Christ comes, say in the end of Matthew, when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. This is the same thing. God's goal is still to fill the world with his own glorious images. Now, those images were cracked and defaced and broken at the fall. But the great commission that has been entrusted to us is simply the mission to, to refurbish those images. That's what we're doing. As we evangelize, as we disciple, as we come to church and worship, We are being refurbished back into God's image. And we're helping others do the same. And Paul's language here, without a doubt, he is harking back to this idea of being fruitful and multiplying. The gospel, in its advance, is continually producing more and more people back into the image of God, the renewed image of God, so that God's original purpose is going to be fulfilled anyway. Nobody can stop it. No devil in hell, no wicked man on earth can stop what God intends to do. And it's going to be wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Now, in Christ's fullness, we receive this mission, this great commission that I'm describing. And this is a marvelous gift. Do you think, have you ever met anybody who was mentally and physically and financially well when they continued in a condition of doing no work whatsoever? Have you ever met anybody who was mentally well when they, ref- they, they literally get up, they sit in their chair, they stare at the wall? Maybe they watch television for eight hours a day or something. Have you ever met a person like that who was doing well? 
No siree. God made us to have work. He made us to have legitimate, good, and useful tasks to perform as human beings. We have to have it. We have to have it. And those tasks change over life. Of course, we retire and we don't do the same job we did. That's all fine. But of course, we know that for our health, we have to continue doing something. Folks, <clears throat> this mission that God has given us fulfills us at that level. You have a wonderful task before you. We do. It is to contribute to this mission of evangelism and discipleship, the Great Commission. Everything that the church is about, it is to work to refurbish these glory images. <coughs> Excuse me. God's image, that's our task. That's something to, that's worth getting up in the morning for. Now, is that enough? Is Christ enough? <coughs> I apologize. At least it's happening toward the end. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> but you, 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 see what, you see what I mean. So we get this in Christ. We get this fullness. We have more than enough in Jesus. We don't need any other kind of religious idea. We don't need any philosophy to be added to this. Christ is more than enough. So let me give you just a few applications and we'll be done. <coughs> First application is bring a bottle of water with you in the pulpit when you visit new churches. That's a, that's a good application. And these kind uh, folks here are helping me out. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Good as new. A couple of applications for you and we'll be done. The first is this, based on the fact that we have this blessed, sure word from heaven that we can absolutely trust, and it undergirds our lives, and it makes us steady, and we're not wondering if God is there, or if Jesus is real, or if heaven and hell are, are real. Based on that, I encourage you to trust the Bible completely. Now, this is extremely practical, I, okay? If you... If you entertain the slightest doubts about Scripture, you wonder if maybe, maybe there really are errors in Scripture. Maybe the whole thing isn't inspired. You know, there's some portions of it that I don't really like, let's say. If you allow yourself to entertain those sorts of ideas, you are leaving the door open. In the middle of the night, you're asking the burglar to come in. You're asking for home invasion in your soul. The enemy will not fail to see it. He will be there. He'd be happy to take that opportunity. You need to trust the Bible 100%. You need to refuse all doubts about whether or not it's true or inerrant, about whether or not it's inspired or authoritative. In order to have a healthy Christian life, we absolutely must submit to the authority, inerrancy, inspiration, and infallibility of Scripture, 100%. There's just no way around it. We have seen in church history so, so many times that Christian groups, churches, seminaries, denominations begin to question the Scripture, and it is the beginning of the end, right? The OPC was formed for just this reason, because people decided they were going to distrust the Bible with all of that brings. So, first application, I urge you, trust the Bible completely. Second application, rejoice in the holy status that God has freely given you. You should be happy. You should have happiness for no other reason but that God has made things right between you and Him. We were born into an evil state. Um, I lived, as an example, for 20 years as a non-Christian, um, I was an enemy of God. His wrath was upon me. I was a slave to sin. I could not get free. Many or most of you are going to, to know what I'm talking about in, in all of that. But God freely brought us into a holy position with himself. And that alone, the fact that your war with God has been brought to an end and you have peace with God through Christ, I tell you that that is enough 
to strengthen a person through literally any earthly hardship. Your biggest problem has been solved already by God's gracious work. Rejoice in that. Number three, eagerly desire your future hope since in the fullness of Christ you have this glorious hope ahead, this marvelous inheritance that's coming for you. Eagerly desire it. We do have a problem in the church, I've noticed, uh, in the churches where I've been and in my own heart, we fail to eagerly desire, to eagerly hope for the promises that God says are coming to us in the end. If we do that, we're going to be weakened. You should, you should stir up that desire. Get Bible verses and memorize them that are about the future reward that's coming, the grace of God that's coming to you, and eagerly desire them. Number four, I have five of these. Number four, spend the rest of your years contributing diligently to God's mission to fill the world with his glory through evangelism and discipleship. And this is nothing other than the work of the church. Spend your years. Find ways that you can contribute to the church, as I'm sure that most or all of you are already doing. Find ways you can serve. Find ways that you can, you can encourage other Christians. You can support them and pray for them. Pray for somebody in your life who's not a Christian and, and, and don't give up. Keep asking God to bring them to Christ. Take the opportunities that arise to talk to them about the Scripture and about the Gospel. Lastly, and really most importantly, in, 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 in light of what Colossians is about, application number five, I encourage you to utterly reject any teaching, any philosophy, any doctrine which even seems to hint that Christ is not enough, that he is less than we need. I encourage you to hate that kind of doctrine, to loathe it. It is loathsome. Anybody who says, like, the, like in Galatians, the Judaizers would come after Paul and they would say, hey, Galatian Christians, it's great that you guys believe in Jesus. Now, let us tell you what else you need. You need to get circumcised. You need to obey the ritual laws of Moses, and then you'll really be complete. I call on you to hate any such doctrine. It is anti-Christian. It is a threat to Christ's glory and a threat to our souls and future. We should be rather convinced that Jesus really, really is enough. We need nothing else beside him. Amen.